This is Senate Government Operations. It is Tuesday, May 11th, and <clears throat> we're just a tiny bit late getting started because we are talking about baby cradles. So sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, so I'm going to give a couple introductory remarks here before we get started. I will say, just for everybody who's um, watching and who is with us, we don't use Zoom in this because we consider Zoom as a side conversation. You, don't use chat. you mean chat. Chat. Oh, you mean yeah, chat. that's what I meant. Zoom because we're all on Zoom. We're all on Zoom. We <laughs> don't use Zoom. We don't use chat. Sorry about that. Because we consider chat a side conversation. If we were in the committee room, we would ask people to go out in the hall and have their conversations. So we, the only way we use uh, chat is if somebody refers to a document or something, then Gail will <clears throat> post it there so that everybody can see it. But other than that, we don't use chat. Let's see, I believe we're moving to um, the changes with S15. Is that what I asked? Yes. Okay. Would you like to, because it was on the uh, floor today and I, we would like some, um, a review of what the house actually did. Have they finished? I mean, do we know that they're, are they done with it now? The floor action, or are they still on the floor? <laughs> they are done for the day. They're done. They finished that earlier. Going okay. to third reading though, Senator Clarkson. Thanks. Okay. So uh, Will or Amron, who wants to um, let us know here what they did? Uh, I can start and Will, if you want to add on sure. that is helpful. Okay. Uh, I asked Gail to post at least three documents for this. Yeah. Uh, the, the report of house government operations with which they uh, did a strike all to make some changes throughout the bill. And then there were uh, three proposals of amendment that were heard on the floor this morning. Two of them were approved, one from the House Appropriations Committee and then one from Representative McCarthy uh, from Government Operations. So I will start with the House Government Operations Report Strike All version. And I think I will just sort of hit where there was a change. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't need to go. Okay. On. You just tell us. <laughs> okay. All right. I think I just got kicked off. I can't. No, you're still with us. Oh, I don't get this at all. It's telling me to join a mi meeting. Well, we don't have a meeting till four. Oh, no. I was trying to go to the, um, never mind. I was trying to go to our page and it keeps, okay. Yeah, is this, is, I'm, I'm not sure I'm finding it on our page. The, the House Proposal Amendment is, is a number, it's a long bill, right? Not just the two pagers. If their amendment is just two pages. So, so is that all we're going to look at? No, the, hold on. I actually have not what's checked to see what's, what's posted. Let me what's, check. Yeah, because there are three First things one. posted, as you said. The HGO Amendment, the McCarthy Amendment, and the House of Probes Amendment. And I thought you suggested we go to the HGO amendment. Oh, it's only two pages I, though. That is actually the appropriations amendment. Did Gail, did I send you the wrong document? Um, I might have switched the labels. I know I was posting and reposting. So I can double check everything here. Uh, we, it looks like we have the house appropriations amendment posted twice. Right. Yeah, yes. it is correct. Let me. So the HGO amendment is what we need because we have a House of Probes amendment clearly marked. Okay, Gail, yeah, the correct link is in my email, so you should have it and be able to post it. I'll forward that email to everybody on the, um, everybody in the room. Can you also then, post it? Yeah, I will post it. Okay. We will refresh. <clears throat> But I first, I'll send it to you so that you have it in your inbox. Okay, thank you.
Hmm. I don't think I've ever heard this committee be so silent. <laughs> Could have taken a pop. I might stand up. It's under, sorry to bother you. <laughs> Should be in your inbox now. Okay. And let us know when it's posted because I want to do it that way. I see it. It, it has pages and lines and when you post. I got it. it. As opposed to in email. It's 37 pages long. If I'm looking at the right one. Yes, you should be looking at one that's 37 pages. I am not. Is it on our, it's in our your, website? Your it's a link in your email. There's three yeah. different amendments. I know, but is it also posted? It's, a, it's working about, on it. Oh, okay. Okay. She's getting there. She's getting there. Senator White, if I yeah. may, while we while you all are waiting. Yep. If anyone's curious, the um, roll call vote on the House floor mm -hmm. this morning to go to third reading was 119 to 30. Oh. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty strong vote. Good. And I can preface Ameren's walkthrough but by saying there weren't a whole lot of substantive changes. And the substantive changes that were made, we my office supported. Um, but it'll be important for you guys to, to check them out and understand what they did. Sometimes it, there's a little bit of a lag posting, but you can refresh and try now. Okay. Well, oh, it, it made it a responsive thing, so. Oh, well, I'll just go to my email. Yeah. Because it doesn't seem to like my refresh. Okay, let's, I guess we, we've all got it some way or other. So can we start? Certainly. And Cameron, if you just walk us through where they made changes, that would be great. Okay. All right, now let me find where I left my version. Okay. So the first substantive change is on page, let me make sure I have the right page here, is on page 12. And this is in the section on, uh, let's see, this is section eight, title 17, section 2539, delivery of early voter absentee ballots. And we are specifically looking at the circumstances where- wait, wait a minute, where are you on page 12? Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna kind of walk you down to where the change is. So oh, okay. you'll see in subdivision 3A on page 11, the circumstances that we're looking at is if a voter transfers his or her registration from another town or city in the state following the mailing of ballots to all active voters by the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. So then if you scroll down onto page 12, um, now we're looking in subdivision B, beginning on line 13, we're looking at if a voter registers to vote for the first time in Vermont, following the time when the Secretary of State's office generated the address file to be used for the mailing of ballots to all active registered voters by the Secretary of State's office, this now reads, the clerk shall either issue a ballot to the voter in person at the time of registration or mail a ballot to the voter within three business days, provided the voter's registration does not occur within five days of the election. If the clerk does not have ballots available at the time of registration, the clerk shall mail a ballot to the voter within three business days after obtaining ballots. So previously, this said that if a voter registers to vote for the first time, then the, um, now I've lost my, 
Um, Previously, if, if you want me to help that thought, Amara, and I had to <laughs> remind myself and I went back and looked at your version it, yeah. it, this, the, this changes. Previously, they had to make a request. I'm sorry, Amory. That's all right. Uh, they had to make a request, and then the ballot would be issued to that voter pursuant to subdivision one of this subsection A. So, uh, so it's it's not too dissimilar. It's just being clear that it does not need to be on request, and then it puts these limited these uh, day limits that if they're going to mail it, it has to be within three business days um, and that they're not going to mail it within five days of the election. And if the clerk, and then addressing the circumstance, if the clerk doesn't have ballots available at the time the person registers. And was there any controversy about this? No. I don't remember any. This is, as Amarin said, she distinguished, if you look at 3A above, 3A is voters transferring among towns in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about that and that got left the way it is, which is that if somebody transfers in Vermont after the time the ballots have been mailed, the file's been pulled, mm -hmm. the clerk checks out whether a ballot's been returned for that person and asks them about the status of the previous ballot. 3B, this section, just refers to people registering for the first time in Vermont. And if it's after the time that file's pulled, they won't have been mailed a ballot. <laughs> and some, some, I think of, I think some of the advocates um, just noted this, that it seemed like the whole intent of the bill would be that a first time registrant in that situation would get an automatic yeah. uh, ballot mailed to them. And then the extra language accounts for, because it's, since it references the time when we pull the mailing file, the clerks may, that may be so early that the clerks don't actually have the ballots. And that's why the language was added that if they don't have the ballots, they mail it as soon as they get them which will be 45 days before the election. Yeah. But Madam Chair. Yep. Just a question on that. Yep. So Will, if they don't have the ballots, maybe it's before the ballots have even been printed. So wouldn't you just automatically let them be included in the statewide mail out? I mean, wouldn't they just, if it's so early that the clerks doesn't have ballots yet, maybe they'll just get mailed the ballot by the, your office. We taught, that's a good question, Senator Clarkson. We talked about that ability for my office to potentially update that mailing file over time between sort of the first iteration of we send it and, and when the ballots start rolling out the door. Yeah. And I honestly, I just didn't, I couldn't commit to being able to do that, not knowing enough about how it's going to work with that vendor, whether it's a one-time file transmission or if it can be updated over the course of time. If we figure out that that's a possibility and easy to do, then we can work with this provision and with the clerks to say, these voters have been added to the mail and file list. I could potentially update them on a daily basis and say, your new registrants have been added to the mail and file list. They don't right. need them. So they wouldn't be duplicating any effort. Yeah. Just didn't know enough about the detail of that process with whoever the vendor is going to be to commit to being able to supplement it like that. I hope so. Okay. Any other concerns about that one? <clears throat> okay. Next change. All right. The next change is on page 16. And right now we're in the section about return of ballots. And this adds a new subsection F, which says no individual may return more than 25 ballots to the town clerk or to a secure ballot drop box unless the individual is a justice of the peace performing his or her official duties pursuant to section 2538 of this title. And that would also, uh, that renumbered the previous subsection F into the G that you see before you. Um, the, and also specifies that the clerk or other local election official accepting the return of ballots shall not be required to enforce the provisions of subsection, this used to say subsection just E, now it says subsections E and F of this section, uh, but shall report any suspected violation to the Secretary of State's office, who shall refer them to the Attorney General's office for investigation. And then on line 15, this previously said candidates violating, this now says individuals violating this section may be subject to penalties. 
there was significant uh, committee discussion on this oh, provision. Well, this is very, this is very interesting and a little bit bizarre. I think that I so um, Grandma Jones is delivers for the people in her neighborhood, and she picks up six of them and takes them to the town hall on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, she runs into seven neighbors and picks them up and drops them off. Is the town clerk gonna be, keep a running number of everybody that brings in a ballot so that they know when, when um, she runs into her friends at the grocery store who say, or if you're running right by the town clerk's office right now, can you just drop these off? And it happens to be ballot number 26. Is the town clerk going to keep a record, a running, like a bar tab? Yeah, particularly with a drop box, which is how would you even know? It says, or to a secure ballot. Right. I mean, you're going to have no idea who's drop box ballots there. I don't, so if, does somebody want to explain this? I, th I think all of what you said is true. And that's why I, it was important to me to have the provision in there that the clerk wasn't responsible for enforcement so that they didn't have to be keeping this running bar tab, as you said, and monitoring the drop box. Um, I think the idea is that having that on the, on the books at least sends a message to people who know that that's the outside limit of ballots that you should be returning for somebody else. I mean, it, it was the same concern about um, ballot harvesting that we've heard that led to this provision. So if I'm I'm a um, friendly neighbor here, I have to keep track for myself of how many ballots I'm picking up or I can be charged because somebody else is watching me yep. bring those ballots back. And I bring uh, 12 of them to the town clerk and then I put another 10 in the drop box and then I want to do four more and I'm in violation, right? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, I think this is searching for, for anyway. I, I think we should discuss this further at some point. Anyway, okay, do you wanna go on? Sure. Sorry. So the next change is all the way down on page 20. <clears throat> and right now we are in the a uh, section that talks about if a ballot is deemed defective. This is subdivision B beginning on line seven and the changes are in uh, Romanet three beginning on line 13. So this actually uh, relates to changes that are, are made further down. Um, I will just read this for now, not later than the next this is, uh, excuse me, this is the clerk. If a ballot is deemed defective, the clerk shall not later than the next business day transmit a notice with information required by the Secretary of State's office. Uh, this previously said mail a postcard uh, rather than transmit a notice to the voter informing the voter that the voter's ballot was deemed defective and rejected. The reason it was deemed defective and the voter's opportunity to cure excuse me, to correct the error. Um, and then this next section is new. Uh, if the ballot was deemed defective because the voter failed to sign the return certificate to place the voted ballot in the certificate envelope or did not return their unvoted primary ballots in the unvoted ballot envelope, the clerk shall include a returnable affidavit designed and provided by the Secretary of State's office with the notice so the voter may cure the deficiency in accordance with subdivision 2547D1C of this chapter. So that means that the, if the ballot was defective, the town clerk now, first of all, they have to notify somebody by whatever means possible, right? It's no longer just a postcard. They have to decide how they're gonna notify the person mm -hmm. and then if they then they have to send them an affidavit first they have to notify them and then do they include the affidavit with their notification yes, it must be included notification 
if, if their notification was by phone or email, then they also have to send them the affidavit. I This says that the affidavit um, shall include a returnable affidavit with the notice. So I read this as require, it would need to be in a form where you can include the affidavit with the notice. It would not be something that you could accomplish by phone and still comply with this section. So if they notify them by phone, then they still have to send, then do they have to send out an affidavit or not? If the defect is one of those three that are listed, then they need to send a notice with an affidavit. I suppose that does not prevent them from also providing notice by means of telephone or some other way that where they could not include the affidavit. But if the defect is one of those three types of deficiency, then they would need to send the affidavit with the notice. That is how this is, is drafted. Is this the, this I believe is the section that had a lot of town clerks worked up because it puts, when we, we did a simple, um, I might be wrong here, but we did a simple postcard and that's how they notified them. It was very clear. They sent out a postcard, end of story. Um, now the town clerks have the responsibility for figuring out how they're going to notify the person. And people will get all worked up because they notified them in the wrong way. It didn't tell them how to notify. So, well, you called my phone and I never answered my phone. You should have sent me an email. And then we have to send them an affidavit if we send them a written notice, but if we call them on the phone and tell them that their ballot was defective, if that's the means that we choose, then we don't have to send them an affidavit. I think it puts a lot of responsibility on the clerks. Uh, Senator Clarkson? Actually, Senator, Senator Palmer? Palmer was first, so I, okay. I will cede my time first to Brian. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Clarkson. So I'm not clear, and I agree with everything the chair has already said. I'm not clear whether transmit a notice means that you actually have to have made contact with the voter, or if I just call and no one's home, oh, well, I transmitted a notice. There's nothing in the bill that says they actually have to make contact with the voter. So is the town clerk responsible for finding every way to contact the voter until that voter is contacted? Or I'm unclear as to, uh, you know, the, uh, the degree of uh, work that the town clerk's gonna have to do here. Yeah. Is that uh, the answer I, to the question? Yeah. Yeah. May I, may I tag onto that? I, I mean, I think this unnecessarily complicates a situation that we made very simple. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is just ridiculous. This is like jumping through 88 hoops. We, if there's a problem, let the person know there's a problem. Let them come in and fix it. Uh, it it's really, this is way over, over the top in my humble opinion. Will, did you? I hope, I think I can help a little bit. Uh, although they're legitimate concerns and I did try and convey sort of everything that we had talked about on the Senate side when we were talking about this particular issue. And this is the biggest change from what you guys did. Um, but to Sen Senator Collimore's questions, I don't see it as putting any further responsibility on the clerks and hear me out. You still have for the first 25 days, they still have the option that you guys had as the only option, but it's still an option for them. They don't have to do anything else besides have a stack of postcards from my office on their desk that they send to anybody they deem defective. And if you think about it, they are going to have a mailing address for everybody that they're doing this for because they just mailed them a ballot that was then successfully returned from that person despite the errors. So just as a baseline, a clerk, and this would be my guidance and my training, hey clerks, if you wanna make it easy, you can just have the stack of postcards on your desk and do postcard notification to anybody. If you want, you can instead notify them by email or by phone during that 25 day period. Then it, we, we haven't really gotten there yet, or I can't remember if Ameren just went through it, but then during the five days, there's the next provision during the five days preceding the election that they really shouldn't mail. It says they're not required to mail anymore. It actually still allows them to do that as their notice means during that time, which I think is important. 
but then it says they have to go to other contact information that they have on file in order to contact the voter. And that was the provision that drew some ire and concern over on the House side from clerks seeing that, that, okay, so during the last five days, am I gonna have to be scrambling to find any contact information I have on file anywhere in the office for these people? And so we made a, an amendment that was part of Rep McCarthy's amendment today that specifically said during that five day period, they only have to use any contact information that they have in the voter checklist. So they don't have to go scouring their office for any other contact information. But so again, the posture is, they, it, I think the thought on the house side was just that you give them, you give them those additional options for notice during the 25 days, they still can just use the postcard and do mailing. And I understand the concerns with the other forms of notice, we talked about it, right? But my best answer to that is the clerk isn't responsible for ensuring anything other than the transmission. And the point was made over on the House side, I think you guys heard it too, that similarly, you don't know whether somebody received the postcard or not. It might get thrown away with the other postcards in their mail or not make it through the USPS in time. So it, in, in all of those modes of transmission, the clerk is only responsible for the first push out the doors, hitting send on the email, leaving the voicemail, or putting the postcard in the mail. And so, Senator White, honestly, your question about the phone paired with the notice did not come up. That's a good one. As a practical matter, if you guys are okay with this, I can tell you what it would be is that the clerks would call them and the affidavit is gonna be available on our website and probably on the clerk's website where the person could then go and get it and send it back or potentially the clerk would have to follow up, you're right, with mailing a physical affidavit. I would think that that, that point that you made would just be discouraging them in the first place from doing it by phone. And, and just as you said, we, what we would intend is, I wanted to get to this too, is to incorporate the affidavit language on the postcard. And so it's just gonna be something where, you know, yes, that was my ballot that you received, even though I failed to sign it or even though I didn't put it in the envelope, or even though I didn't return the two primary ballots. That will also be included in, I've talked to my programmers already, and we, we will be able to set it up where as soon as the clerk marks the ballot defective in the system for that voter, you're in on that voter and you're saying return defective, boom, you'll get a little pop-up that says send email notice. One click, they can hit it. And if there's an email on file, you'll send an email notice with that same affidavit ability to respond. And last thing, we, we thought I should be able to put that affidavit, a means to submit it on the My Voter page also, so that you log into the My Voter page in the same way you can do an address update through that page. You could, and you can respond to a challenge letter through that page. You could send a note to the clerk that says, that's my ballot, I'd like to cure it. So the, they're not actually including a returnable affidavit. What they're including is a link to an affidavit that they can return. And no, in the case of the postcard and the email, it'll be a, a returnable affidavit right there. You're going to be able to return a portion of the postcard. Okay. Saying that's my ballot. With the email, I envision you'll be able to check it off electronically and send it back. Okay. Um, okay. But you're right, you can't transmit that affidavit by phone. And that did not come up. So the postcard will have like a little tear off or something? Yes. OK. And that, it's, it's, I want you to understand the intent of it, too, because I actually really like that affidavit provision. It's not going to be helpful in a lot of cases to have to mail a whole new set of ballots back out to somebody who's out of state or across the state. And it would be much easier to be able to have them just affirm that that first set is their ballot. It's cost effective, it saves time. Um, it really makes sense to have this option. Okay, I get it. Yep. Other questions? I was, I was just curious yeah. when, when this amendment came up, was this a committee amendment that, or was it on the floor? No, it was one of the first early committee okay. amendments we talked about. Okay. And Mike and McCarthy took care of the second, um, but that was a committee amendment offered by him? Yes. Yeah. And, and that you'll see the next major substantive amendment is just the flip side of it, 
in the voter section where it's talking about defective ballots. Ameren's about to get there, but that's where it proactively gives the voter this right to respond by affidavit. Okay. Okay. So following this section um, in subsection B on page 21, beginning at line three, this is the section that was amended on the floor this morning. Do you want me to switch over to that language or come back to it after we've gotten through the remainder? No, that would be perfect if we switched, I think, so we can follow in line, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm now looking at the, oops, that's not it. The amendment by Representative uh, McCarthy, specifically the second instance of amendment, which would, uh, it strikes this subsection B out entirely, but really the only uh, portion that's changed is the sentence beginning with, in these cases, the clerk shall make a reasonable effort to provide notice to the voter as soon as possible uh, using any contact information for the voter and then is inserted other than the mailing address that is contained in the voter checklist. So that was the change in this language so that it's, it's clear that rather than just using any contact information for the voter, it has to be any contact information the voter other than the mailing address that is contained in the voter checklist. And I don't know, Will, if you want to add any context on that more than you already have. Just what I said before. I worked with Rep Paella pretty closely to come up with that language, who is the town clerk in Londonderry. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so that is subsection B. Now I'm moving on to the next change, which is all the way down on page 30. And this is the section on how a voter may cure the defect. Uh, so there were a couple changes. There's a change in subdivision B. Uh, by So the language as it read before was requesting a new ballot to be mailed to them by the clerk along with materials for submission of the new ballot provided the new ballot is received. And this previous, previously said by the town clerk or uh, the, uh, did we say presiding officer? I think it said by the town clerk or prior to the closing of polls. Um, and so the change was to remove the town clerk part and say received by the presiding officer or other sworn election official prior to the closing of the polls, um, understanding that the ballot, uh, to clear up any confusion that someone might think they can bring their ballot to the town clerk's office at 658 on election day and think that it will make it to uh, the presiding officer or other sworn election official by the closing of polls. So subdivision C is new, and this is to add in the concept of curing a defective ballot by affidavit, which we just saw the clerk's instructions on what the clerk's obligations are. Now this is on what the, the voter needs to do. So subdivision C for a voter who failed to sign the certificate envelope, failed to place the voted ballot in the certificate envelope, or did not return uh, their unvoted primary ballots in the unvoted ballot envelope, returning the signed affidavit included in the notice under subdivision 2546A2B Romanet 3 of this subchapter, either by mail, in person or electronically, provided the affidavit is received by the presiding officer or other sworn election official prior to the closing of the polls. So does that mean that the presiding officer has to have constant email availability? On election day, I'm talking. About. It's a good question, Senator Collimore. They would not, because in a lot of cases, they don't have internet access at their polling places. 
Well, then how so, can they be responsible for receiving it electronically? Mm -hmm. Boy. Yeah, it does sound like they would have to have, because if I were a voter and I sent it, it says I can, I can send it prior to the close. I don't know if they have internet capability at the polling place or not. That's not my problem. That's theirs. <laughs> no. Or that maybe. issue was not raised, Senator Collimore. I think thinking about it right now off the top of my head, I would have them, um, that would be an instance where they would have to adjust their official results after election night. So they get back to the office the next morning and see that they'd been they'd received an email about one of their defective ballots, they could still go pull that defective ballot from the envelope. I just, well. I don't think that we will be seeing a, a large volume of ballots being cured by email on election day, but it's fair to think about. Either by mail or person electronically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think that's something for us to discuss further. You know? I think you, you could address it by if you entered if you had a provision that electronic return of the affidavit had to be there by the day before the election. It, exactly. Yeah. I mean I think we I think we should look at I mean, we're just hearing this for the first time, so I'm. Yep. We're, I'm hoping we're marking things that we want to address. This would be one. Yep. Okay. All right. So moving down to page thirty-five. You'll see section 21 has been deleted. This was the section that created the assistant director of elections position at the Secretary of State's office and provided funding. This is now in the budget, so it has been removed from this bill. Any questions on that? No. Okay. And the next change was in section 21A following that. Uh, the title of this section used to be voting access semicolon report. It now is voting access and verification report. And in this section, there is now a new subdivision three that was added onto this report requirement. This is a report required of the Secretary of State's office on or before January 30th, 2023 to the government operations committees with recommendations and any excuse me, with findings and any recommendations for legislative action on now subdivision three, implementing a voter verification system in Vermont that will not disenfranchise voters and that will verify that ballots have been voted by registered voters, including a report back on the time, training and cost involved in implementing the system or systems. I have no idea what that phrase means. <laughs> uh, what does just implementing a voter verification system that will not disenfranchise voters me. It I seems like no voter suppression language. <laughs> no, I think it, I think, I, I actually think it means that, um, <clears throat> is there some kind of a system out there where you could require voter verification that doesn't disenfranchise people? I mean, it's like trying to have your cake and eat it too. Right, I don't. Verified, but we don't want it to be, uh, Disenfranchising people. Yeah, I, I, I would, if I were writing that, I would have written whether or not we should have a system. Yeah, I, not I the, but I'm not going to argue about that because the Secretary of State will do what they're going to do in a report. Um, but well, I, I think we should mark it for further discussion. I don't, I don't think it needs to leave. Okay. Us in the same if way. we're going to do, if we're going to make other changes, then we might want to. Uh, yeah, say whether or not we should to, implement. We've identified at least three things for further discussion. Yeah. 
Senator, if I may, Senator White, really quickly to Senator Collimore's question, I do think it, it's mainly referring to, and you're right, it, it may not be as artfully worded as it might have been, but it's referring to the return of absentee ballots. So voter verification is being able to verify that uh, it was the voter themselves who returned the ballot. It's the signature verification issue and, and whether if that's not appropriate for Vermont, could we find out something different that would be? Well, you said that much more artfully than that sentence did. <laughs> and that is in no way a comment on Ameren's drafting because I, that no, was I didn't mean it that out way. Out of her control, yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling it was suggested by somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I've had no problems with Ameren's ability to parse the English language. <laughs> so, committee, how do you how do you want to do this? They, they did they do third reading today? No. No, they just did finish second reading. It sounds like so they're yes. going to do third tomorrow. We'll get it Friday. Um. We'll get it Friday. Okay, between now and Friday, we will have we can have this discussion. Right. On these three, at least three issues. One, I don't remember what it was. It was page 16 F. Right. <laughs> I wrote it down. 16. And one was the electronically. That's the number of ballots that can be returned by one. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. And then the other one was the report. And the defective ballot. And the curing issue, if we want to look at that. I mean, all those endless provisions. Well, if the town clerks are happy with that now, I well, am. Are they? Are they? That's my understanding. They are. Yeah. And, and I just, know that Kelly was one of the people. Right. That, I heard Will say that. Just to focus so that you don't have to look at all of those curing provisions. Really, what you were talking about was electronic return of the affidavit on election day. Right. Yeah. I think well, I think that Senator Clarkson was referring to the um, the part that um, gave town clerks many options for mm -hmm. instead of just giving them the. Got it. And, but if the town clerks are okay with having those options, I'm okay with it. Uh, the affidavit is an additional effort, which is, I mean, I know Will says he supports it, but it, that's an additional effort too. Well, not if it's on the, if it's yeah, printed keep in mind, on we're the postcard. incorporating it into the notice. And what it's really doing is preventing the additional effort of them having to send another package of ballots out to all of these folks. Right. In order so for them have, to cure. You have a postcard that is two parts and one of them says it's defective and you can return this little affidavit on the bottom, just tear it off and send it back in and says, and you say, yes, I swear that that was my ballot. I returned it and here's my intent. And the same with the email. It's part of the notice itself. It isn't an extra step. And it does remove the extra step then of having to send out the new ballots. True, but if you had a postcard that just said your ballot is defective, come in and he it. he already said that there would be a tear off part to it that you would send back. Because if you just send a postcard and says your ballot is defective, you can change it. You can, and then the person calls and says, "Well, will you send me a new ballot?" Well, no. Then you can ask them just to come in and fix it. There's a lot. A lot of these people are out of state or too far away to come in. And, oh, and fix it. Part. And so your previous version said they could do that, come to the clerk's office and fix it, or be mailed a new set of ballots. And this it, substitutes for that. Well, yeah. this simplifies it in some ways. And Senator Carson, I think that's right, though, because it's important to remember the whole context. I think a lot of these people will be local and will just swing by the office and fix it. Um, and those are the kind of people you could call. People you know are right down the street. Hey, Mary, your ballot's defective. You should swing by and fix it. And that flexibility, then I have to send Mary a postcard when I can do that. But okay, so, so I continue. 
Oh, I thought that was, I thought we were on page we're hoping 30. we were done. There's a little oh. more. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, we were only at page 36. Yes. There so. are only 37 pages. <laughs> yeah, that's why I think we jumped to the conclusion we were. So uh, there is a new section now, section 22 on page 36 regarding the maintenance of the voter checklist. So the new provision you'll see is on page 37. This adds a subdivision six that says that the secretary of state shall make reasonable efforts on an ongoing basis to compare the information on the checklist with data or information contained in any state agency's database, a database administered by the federal government or any database of another state or consortium of states where possible in an effort to maintain the accuracy and currency of the checklist. Hmm. Actually, that like sounds that. very big brotherish to me. <laughs> it, do, it does. It says, what if I use, what if I use um, one email with the tax department and I use another email for my checklist or I use my, phone my cell phone for one and my landline for another i mean really do we i don't know somebody put it on here i think this sounds very much like um we're going to make sure that your information is the same everywhere you give it damn it right and it may not be anyway let's add it to our list for review Will, do you want to comment on that? Real, or? real quickly, I hadn't, sorry, I hadn't scrolled down to the language, but I, that is not how I read it, Senator White. It's, that's telling us to make an effort at data comparison mm -hmm. of the whole list to other databases. For instance, the Department of Health <laughs> records that we already do um, for purposes of trying to figure out whether somebody's moved, not because the data has to match perfectly between those, those two systems at all times. Then the intent of this, at least as I understand it, was to essentially codify what my office already does and is committed to do, like being members of ERIC um, and using the available databases we have so that we can ensure that future administrations continue to do that. And I think it was to, meant to send a message that we're serious about checklist maintenance because we'd heard so many concerns about the current status of the voter checklist and what do you do to keep it up? So I think it was trying to put on the books that you, we have to, on an ongoing basis, make these <clears throat> efforts. I, don't, I still don't understand what the effort mean, what it means. Senator well, Colomar? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I think I'm understanding what Will's uh, referencing. If somebody moves to another state, but they're still on our checklist, this is a way to at least say, wait a minute, they're registered in two different states. Let's compare them and see where this person really should be voting kind of thing. Or they got a driver's license in that yeah. state. That's what I took it to mean. I didn't, I didn't feel a big brother-ish aspect to it. I just felt it was uh, prudent to use all the resources the Secretary of State's office has to make sure that what we have for our voter checklist is as accurate as we could get it. Yeah, I, I agree. I the one the the sen the phrase that bothered me was in any state agency's database. So <clears throat> the what does that mean when you compare your checklist to the health database or to the driver's license database or um, <clears throat> the tax department or uh, what, what the unemployment. I, I don't know. What does it mean to compare your list to their lists? Just that. To compare what, the two why, lists. See, see where purpose? the more current record is. Or in the health department's case, it's just to, to take the people who have died and remove them from our list. That, I can see if you're using it for that purpose, but the health department has other databases like who's been vaccinated and who hasn't and who, um, I mean, I, I, and I think yeah. it just seems, I, I don't know why you would compare because they don't have 
uh, uh, anyway, I'm okay with it. I guess if everybody else is, it just um, makes me a little nervous. Well, I was okay with how it's worded. It, it talks about us making a reasonable effort and leaves pretty broadly the, the sources of information we could use for it. Can you give an example of, do you try to do that now? Are you blocked in some way from doing that now? Where would you go most, most frequently? No is the real answer. We're, we're not inhibited from doing that in almost any way right now. And that's why I described it as sort of trying to codify our current practice and just make sure that it continues into the future. And the best example is our membership in this Eric group that I've re referred you guys to a few times now. That is really a nationwide effort to do exactly what that paragraph describes. That, that I can see because that um, is Senator Collimore's um, example there, somebody moves mm -hmm. and they're, that I can see entirely. I don't get at all. Just give me an example of a state agency other than people dying Mm -hmm. that you would look at the, you would compare the databases and to, for what purpose and what would you do with it? Can I get back to you? Sure. I, I think I, I hate to, one. If, huh? somebody, if somebody moves from Brattleboro to Burlington, you're going to have two separate addresses in different databases. The secretary of state probably would want to have the most recent address on file so that they know where they're voting. But some some people, you know, if they're a student, for example, might be making the decision, I still want to vote in Brattleboro, even if I'm in Burlington right now. So it just seems like you're kind of choosing to make a decision for somebody. That they, There's they nothing in that on. provision about changing any voter record or doing anything to any voter record. But it still says you might just streamline the information, which I think still could make a decision on someone else's behalf that they didn't want made. So maybe what we'll do is ask Will to come back with a couple examples of other than um, <clears throat> address changes for voting purposes and people dying. What other, why would you compare the, my name to a database for people who have fishing licenses? Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is Amber and are, are, did we jump ahead? Are you done now? Not quite done. No. Uh, <laughs> so. today. So one thing I had suggested that the bill title be amended um, at the bottom of the an act relating to mailing out ballots, correcting defective ballots, and miscellaneous changes to state election laws. This is is long, but it describes what this is doing for the most part. Um, so that's something to think about. And then also, Madam Chair, I could very quickly walk through the House Appropriations Amendment that okay. was approved this morning on the floor. Okay. Good. Um, and that is also posted on the website for today. This would add a new section, section 22A, entitled Appropriations Fiscal Year 2022 Funding Source. So this would appropriate $800,000 to the Secretary of State's office for one-time elections-related expenses in fiscal year 2022. And it lays out how the appropriation will be funded, which is first, the amount of $400,000 in general funds is appropriated to the Secretary of State's office. Two, uh, the remaining $400,000 appropriation shall be funded by the Secretary of State Service Fund or by Help America Vote Act, also known as HAVA funds, to the extent those funds are available to absorb the costs or from other federal funds made available to the Secretary of State's office. And then in subdivision three, to the extent the uh, costs cannot be funded or absorbed as outlined in subdivisions one and two, the Secretary of State's office shall include any remaining costs in its fiscal year 2022 budget adjustment proposal. And now I'm done. <laughs> and did they have that in their budget? I don't remember. 
did the house have it the house have it in their but their action their budget also yes as okay. far as i know that's what i okay great the money stuff is not my expertise sorry <laughs> <laughs> nor mine <laughs> as my committee knows all right um committee um i'm going to suggest that um we have I'm going to suggest that we take, oh my goodness, it's 340. Yeah, and we have a four o'clock. Oh, Larry, Larry, Larry. Poor Larry. I have to say, we need to probably. We'll have cake for you the next time you come, Larry. Oh, in Zoom land, I'm not sure that's a fair promise. Well, we can each <laughs> be eating a piece of cake and pretend like we're giving him cake. Oh, that, that won't work. That's the let them eat cake. That would be a very bad reflection. <laughs> I apologize. Both both the topics that we had this morning or this afternoon took longer than I thought. That's my bad planning. And um, <clears throat> so we can um, just briefly talk about Let's let's jump here to ethics right now and say that tomorrow we'll come back and um, d and look at these issues from the elections bill. Is that fair? Yep. So give us some time to think about it and to figure out where we want to go. And in the meantime, I will try to talk to the um, chair of House DevOps to to figure out if we made changes, what that would mean. And then do a serious, um, that shouldn't take us more than, what, half an hour, do you think? And then, and then do a serious um, uh, look at the code of ethics. And in the meantime, maybe we can just have, have a little conversation with Larry for a while and then take a five or 10 minute break before, before we go to the chair's meeting. Sounds good. I, I do apologize. This um, week has, uh, last week and this week have challenged my, I need that um, agenda fairy godmother. <laughs> well, you still have the fairy godmother. We just don't have the same time to do oh. the, yeah. All right. Thank you, Will, Amron. That was, um, thank you. And we will um, look at those three or possibly four areas. Um, it, Chair, Amron, White, Chair White, what you're missing is your wand. That's true. I'm missing both my wand and my gavel. And poor Amron doesn't even know about the wand. Well, I, I don't. I have a wand. It's one of those that has the little sprinkly colored sprinkles inside of it, you know, and you tip it up and down and it goes like this and they float down and then they float down. And when we come to issues that simply can't be resolved, I wave my wand and they resolve. But it's in my committee room. Um, actually, Amarin can, if she's ever in the state house, she could go access it. She could go get the wand. <laughs> yes, Amarin. I really do apologize. I realized I did not cover the other portion of Representative McCarthy's uh, floor oh. amendment okay. this what? morning. Oh. Um, I got sidetracked. So uh, if you look at his amendment, it's the first instance of amendment. Luckily, this is not a complicated uh, change, but it is a change. This okay. has to do with uh, ballots being when ballots may be returned using those secure drop boxes. Presently, um, or previously, in your version and in the in the first House Government Operations recommended version, it's it still had the language that uh, ballots may be deposited in the drop boxes until the close of business on the day before election. This would allow in subdivision two a board of civil authority to vote to allow ballots to be deposited in the drop boxes on the day of election um, up until 
at some point up until the closing of the polls on election day. So that was a flexibility that was uh, requested. And so that went into a, a floor amendment for this. So you can, you can look at the language a little more closely um, in the amendment and compare that to what's currently in the bill. And I don't know if you wanna add that to your discussion topics, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that I highlighted that that was approved this morning. I don't know that I have any problems with that. If the BCA does it, then they're gonna to have to figure out how to get the ballots. Okay. I, I don't have any problem with that as long as it's situated at the polling place. Or if the BCA decides that they can, they're gonna have somebody sitting beside the drop box and at seven o'clock, they're gonna rush them to the polling place. They have been received, but they're, that's their decision. Yeah, they can, yeah, they can do what they want. Okay. Thank you.